Hello, and welcome back to Craig Does Physics. So, today we are going to be continuing to work through Griffith's Intro to Electrodynamics, and today we'll be doing Chapter 1, Problem Number 14. Now, this problem says, suppose that f is a function of two variables, y and z only. Show that the gradient, uh, del f, is equal to uh, df dy y hat plus df dz z hat transforms as a vector under rotations, equation 29. And then it gives us this long hint that df dy bar equals df dy, dy dy bar, etc. and the analogous formula uh, for df dz bar. Um, knowing what the y bar and z bar components are, we can solve these and then compute the needed derivatives. Um, the nice thing about this problem is that the hint pretty much tells you exactly how to do it. Um, so, before I get into the actual problem, I feel like it'd be pertinent to just maybe go through what this problem means first, since the math behind it isn't too complicated. So, we're given a scalar function f, it's a function of two variables, y and z, uh, we know that the gradient of it looks like this, and we want to show that the gradient of this scalar function transforms as a vector under rotations. What does that mean? Well, if you are not certain what that means, then before I explain it, I highly suggest that you go to back to section 1.1.5, how vectors transform, read through that. Um, because it gives a pretty good detailed explanation on that. But uh, to boil it down into a couple sentences, basically what we're looking for is to show that this vector, the gradient of f, is in fact a vector, i.e. it transforms like the displacement vector under the same transformations applied to, the, to a given displacement vector. Um, so, in this case, the transformation we're looking at is a rotation. A rotation of the yz axes about a common x equals x bar axis. This could be coming into the board, going into the board, um, however you define it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the yz plane by an angle uh, phi, and that will give us our y bar, z bar axes. We want to show that the gradient, if we were to apply this rotation transformation, that our gradient before and after this rotation would look like, would be affected in the same way you would expect a displacement vector to be affected before and after the same rotation. That is given by equation 1.29, which it mentions in the problem text, and that is this linear algebraic um, matrix equation here. I won't go and explain this or how this is derived again. It's given in the, um, in the text in that section, uh, but pretty much just know that this comes from some simple trig, simple geometry. Uh, and our goal is basically going to be to, to reproduce this matrix except with the gradient, not with displacement. So, that brings us over here. Given the matrix, given how it's solved in the section, we have our equations for y bar with respect uh, in terms of the original y, z, and uh, the rotation phi, likewise with z bar. And to get these terms, these matrix elements, well, let's look at this equation, for example. So uh, the nice thing, first off, is that since f is a scalar, scalar, uh, scalars don't transform under rotations. They don't transform under a vector. So uh, we can just leave df the same. We don't have to look at this and do df bar and do all this, you know, all these grievances to, to transform f as well. We know that f is going to be the same because it's given to us as a scalar 
But since we're taking the gradient of it, what we're taking the gradient of the axes with respect to, that is going to change. And so we can write out a, an equation like this, df dy bar equals df dy, dy dy bar, plus df dz, dz dy bar. This is the kind of equation that you would learn taking, um, you know, your intro calculus to, uh, to partial derivatives and multivariable calculus. So this equation isn't too complicated, but we can look at this equation and sort of how it looks like this matrix equation, and we can realize that these terms, this dy dy bar, dz dy bar, are in fact going to be the elements of this transformation. Because what we expect is that eventually we'll get something that looks like df dy bar, df dz bar, knowing that there's an analogous equation here for df dz bar. And these terms, df, or excuse me, not df, uh, dy, dy bar, dz, dy bar, and then down here, d, dy, dz bar, dz, dz bar, df, dy, df, dz. I'm kind of running into my uh, little diagram here. But um, you should be able to see how just knowing how to multiply matrices and vectors, how this matrix would reproduce this equation and the analogous equation for um, df, dz bar. Uh, and so, seeing that this equation is similar to equation 29, which the problem charged us with replicating, we can see that really at this point we just want to show that, for example, dy dy bar is cosine phi, dz dy bar is sine of phi, so on and so forth. So, with that in mind, now all we have to do is calculate these matrix elements from the uh, relationships between them that are given by what was derived in the section for uh, the displacement, well, the uh, displacement coordinates um, in the pre-rotated axes and the rotated axes. So, how are we gonna do that? Well, if we look at this, it wants us to take a function for y and derive it with respect to y bar wants us to take a, an equation for z and derive it with respect to y bar. Right now we have equations for y bar and z bar in terms of y and z. So what we want to do is invert these equations. And rather than having our equations for y bar and z bar, get the equations for y and z. So uh, let's go and do that. So for example, we could start with solving for y from the equation from y, for y bar. And that would be y bar minus z sine phi divided by cosine phi. Now that we have this equation for y, we can plug it back into the equation for z bar minus, uh, minus sine phi times what we found for y. y bar minus z sine phi. So we plug this y back into here. Uh, now what we want to do is solve this out in terms of z for z, because once we get z, then we'll only have it in terms of the uh, y bars and z bars. So um, how do we do that? Uh, well, first we just distribute this to make it a little bit easier. Uh, so this would be minus y bar sine phi over cosine phi. Uh, I could write tan because this is just tangent, um, but as you'll see shortly, um, things will cancel out and keeping it like this just makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Um, and then plus z times sine squared phi over cosine phi plus z cosine 
So, I believe I still have everything right. Yes. Yes, we're good. Um, and this still equals z bar. So then what we could do is we could transform this to get an equation for z. So z, and then we would have sine squared phi over cosine phi plus cosine phi equals on the other side z bar plus y bar sine phi cosine phi. Okay, well, we're almost there. Uh, we're gonna do a couple more steps. First off is we're gonna divide this side by cosine of phi, uh, because once we divide this side by cosine of phi, then we can see that the term on the right here, cosine phi over cosine phi will be one, plus sine squared of phi over cosine squared of phi is tan squared phi. If you remember your trig identities, then you might recall that one plus tan squared of phi is actually just secant squared of phi, where of course secant is one over cosine. On the other side, we have z bar over cosine phi plus y bar sine phi over cosine squared of phi. But bearing in mind that this is the same as one over cosine squared of phi, all we have to do now to get just the z on this side is multiply both sides by cosine squared of phi. We do that for z bar, this becomes z bar cosine of phi, and this becomes y bar sine phi. Excellent. So there's our equation for z. Now we want the equation for y. Um, to do that, we could just, for example, just plug it back in up here. Um, so I'll write that over on this side. y equals um, y bar over cosine of phi minus sine of phi. And then z, z bar cosine phi plus y bar sine phi. Um, so then what we get is z bar, oh, y bar, y bar, one over cosine phi minus sine squared phi. And then minus z bar sine phi cosine phi. All right. Oh, whoops. Uh, this should this should be well, this should be sine phi over cosine phi actually. Uh, so I did not do that right. <laughs> that gets that gets rid of that term actually, and then uh, we also see that uh, this will be. Uh, okay. One over, no, 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 that was right. One over cosine phi minus, uh, one bar, jeez. Uh, over cosine phi. Um, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, and z bar sine phi. Um, I don't know about you, but one minus sine squared phi to me looks like just cosine squared of phi. So then if we have cosine squared of phi over cosine phi, that'll just be cosine phi. So y bar 
cosine phi minus z bar sine phi. Hooray! All right, now on to our last step, which is just calculating the partial derivatives. So we can start with dy dy bar. Of course, if we're deriving this equation uh, with respect to y bar, then this all goes to zero, constant gets taken out, we're left with cosine of phi. Likewise, dy dz bar, get rid of the z bar, we get minus sine of phi over here. dz dy bar sine of phi and dz dz bar cosine of phi. Did these match up? Well, dy dy bar, which is top left, is cosine of phi. Boom, that works. Uh, dy dz bar, bottom left, is minus sine of phi. That works. Uh, top right, dz dy bar is sine. That works. And bottom right, dz dz bar is cosine. That works. So, dot dot dot, qed, we have shown by calculating the the so-called matrix elements um, for the transformation matrix uh, for the gradient of a scalar f in a coordinate system that undergoes a rotation about the x-axis by an angle phi as the same transformation matrix as a displacement that undergoes the same uh, coordinate system rotation. Hence, we can say confidently that the gradient of our scalar function f does act as a vector. Thank you.